we thank you for calling us again into worship, to getting to pray with Kevin, to sing with, with Linda and with Mel and Scott and Julie and together as God's people in this congregation where you pour your spirit back into us again when we feel empty and depleted and questioning, where you build us up again so that we might go out in your name, full of your love. Lord, fill us again today as we worship and as we listen and hear your word and let it do its incredible miracle work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As we open Revelation, we quickly have learned that John is writing from Patmos, from a small desolate island off the coast of Asia Minor, where he has been confined, where he has been sent into uh, hard labor for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's about 95 AD, and John is alone. He's possibly writing from a cave. In fact, when you go to Patmos today, they would like to show you that cave. But it's the Lord's day. That's what John tells us. Uh, right from the beginning, as we learned in the last couple of weeks. It's the Lord's Day, it's Sunday, where this desolate, lonely place becomes the very gates of heaven, where God pours his heart and spirit back into John when he had nothing left but a pen and prayer. John hears a voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And as we learned last week, his first stunning vision is of Christ himself in all of his glory. And he's standing in the midst of the lampstands. And Jesus tells him that these lampstands represent the seven churches to which he wants John to write these letters. Now, I want to stop right there and think about the fact that Jesus asked John to write these letters to the seven churches. Because when we think of the book of Revelation, we don't often think about those seven letters. We think about those wild and incredible visions about the past, the present, and the future. And a lot of us would prefer to go directly from this awesome vision of Christ to the glorious ecstasies of heaven in, in, at the end of the book of Revelation. And on to visions of Christ's victory over monsters of wickedness. But not so fast, Jesus says. Not so fast. It's the church. It's the sometimes boring, disappointing, but also beautifully messy church that Jesus wants John to attend to right now. Where Jesus calls you and me to persevere in faith and hope and love together. Now for me, taking a, a lonely walk on the beach, or through the mountains, or actually getting out on the marina and rowing with Kevin, could feel very tempting as a substitute for going to church once in a while. I love doing things like that. Reading an inspiring book, admiring a beautiful painting, those kinds of contemplative experiences and powerful experiences are important. They are. But Jesus asks more of me and you with each other. And he has more for us to do. He says, don't forsake meeting together in his word. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, bear one another's burdens. And you can't do those things all by yourself. We were brought into this world in community. We thrive and we live in community. And God continues to call us back to a spiritual community where we are learning and growing to be and to live and to do more like Jesus is, lives, and does. And so Jesus speaks to John first about the state of his church, beginning with the church that's closest to Patmos, the church of Ephesus. 
Let's read these verses. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this to your credit, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We'll get to them later. Let anyone who has an ear to hear, let anyone who has an ear to listen to, <laughs> let me try that again. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. So Jesus, in these letters to the seven churches, often has a word of encouragement, often has a word of correction, often has a word of promise. And we're going to see each of those in this first letter, his letter to Ephesus. And his word of encouragement is this, I know your works. I see what you're doing. The Christians of Ephesus were bearing witness to Christ under an incredible burden of persecution in the midst of the first and greatest city of Asia, Asia Minor. The city of Ephesus was a central, fabulous Roman city. It was known for its uh, grand marketplace, for its uh, tremendous amphitheater uh, that held thousands of people. It was known for its sporting events, much like the Olympic Games. It was known for its magicians. It was known for its incredible temples. And one particular temple uh, in particular, the, the Temple to Artemis, had uh, the size one and a half times of a football field with something like 127 beautiful columns, a forest of columns, each one at least 60 feet high, breathtaking and powerful architectural structures. The city would have been impressive in any century. Paul spent three years of his life founding a church in Ephesus, and later John becomes the bishop of Ephesus. It's the church and the city to which he will return after he leaves the island of Patmos around AD 97. What does Jesus have to say to this city, or rather this church in this tremendous city? He says, I know your works, says the Lord, your toil and your patient endurance, that you are bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. It's good to know that God knows. It's good to know that we are seen. And don't we also feel that way just in everyday life? When we feel like we're doing well, when we feel like we've done something that we've sacrificed, that we've served, that we've given of ourselves, as much as we'd hate to admit it, it's nice to know that somebody sees it. It's nice to know that it's known. Maybe we don't want to tell everybody about it, we don't want to brag about it, but when somebody notices, it feels good. And it's okay. We need to be affirmed and encouraged. And Jesus says, I see your good works. I see what you're doing, bearing up for the sake of my name. It's not escaped my notice. When we work for a just cause, when we've worshipped passionately, when we've helped each other grow spiritually, he knows when we've persevered despite weariness, despite exhaustion, and we've continued to keep on keeping on in the faith. This might be one of those weeks where just getting here to church with all of the bad news, with all that's going on, perhaps in your own personal life, 
But you say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep on keeping on. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to keep on trusting in you, my mighty, loving God. I see you, Jesus says. I see you. And I love you. And Jesus continues, I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have resisted the influence, influence of the Nicolaitans. Now, that was a, a Christian sect in Asia Minor that we know nothing about today, possibly related to one of the deacons of the early church who went astray. We don't really know for sure. A lot of it is speculation. But what we, what we, what we can conjecture is that this particular sect had sort of embraced the culture of the Roman Empire in order to get by, in order to survive. And that included uh, eating the food that was sacrificed to idols, which the early church said, nah, don't get near those temples. It's not going to be a good story. As well as the temple prostitution that was a part of that whole thing and, uh, and everything that went with that Roman society. And to do it especially to avoid persecution. To, to syncretize with that is bad news. So in other words, Christians of Ephesus, I know that you have held fast to the truth about me despite opposition, despite the fact that everyone around you is doing something completely different. And you've done it with courage, and you've done it with perseverance. It's not easy. God knows that we need to know what we're doing right. That the work we've done for him is not in vain. But he also knows that every virtue, that every strength has a shadow side. Every strength has a shadow side. And so because he knows both our strengths and our weaknesses, he's not finished. And so he goes on to speak the truth to the Ephesians, a word of correction. He says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Despite their doctrinal purity and their resistance to false teachers and stuff that was going to lead them far astray of the goodness and the truth and the power and the light of Christ. Despite the fact that they were very good at discerning between right and wrong, falsehood and truth, Jesus had something against them. He literally says, your love, if you looked at it in the Greek text, your love, the first, implied the first love, your love, the first love, from the Greek word proton, which means the first, the most important, the foremost, the elemental, the foundational, the number one most important, never forget love, you have abandoned it. You've abandoned it. You've lost it. The essential love that you need to have as my people, you've lost it. They had forgotten, as we can so easily do, that following Christ is not first about doctrinal purity. It's not first about designing attractive church websites. It's not first about balancing a budget or knowing what the mark of the beast is in Revelation 13. Or being able to decipher 666, which a lot of us would like to do right now as we're thinking about the book of Revelation. It's about loving Jesus and loving others. Love is proton. Love is first, Jesus says. Don't forget it and don't abandon it. The striking thing about this passage is that it's not talking about one person. It's talking about an entire church. It's you all, Jesus is saying. You've lost your love. An entire church can be doctrinally correct, financially solvent, organizationally sound, but void of love and absent of life. Get your mind around that. Get your heart around that with me. You can have all that going for you 
and still be void of number one, the love of Christ. So what can be done? That sounds pretty serious. Two things, Jesus says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember from where you have fallen. Memory is a powerful thing. I want to try to call to mind that moment or season with you, your life and mine, when Christ became very real to you. Remember, when you sensed that Jesus was, really was the way, the truth, and the life. When you fell in love with the Word, when you gave yourself to the Lord. Can you remember that moment? Can you remember that season in your life when it began to become clear? When a new love was planted in your heart, a new compassion, a new grace, a new capacity for forgiveness, a new ability to endure and to persevere with others, a new, a new larger power to love like Jesus loved you. It may surprise you to know that it wasn't love for the book of order that made me a Christian. It wasn't love for the polity of the Presbyterian church that brought me to Christ. And I grew up in a Presbyterian house. It wasn't love for Greek that made me a Christian. It wasn't love for church politics that made me a Christian. It's the love of Jesus alive and risen, knowing that he lived and died and rose again for me. And really, it was the, 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 the experience of the presence of the person of Christ that drew me to his heart. And his overcoming love in my life again and again and again, sometimes at my very lowest points, even despairing points, experiencing his grace and his I'm here and I'm real, follow me. The one who lived and died for me and wants me to love and know and serve as he has called me to do. Remember, I want you to remember today. I want you to rejoice in those memories as David did remembering those joy, days of joy, worshiping in the house of God. And then he says, repent. Meta noe san. Change your mind. That's what that basically says. Have a transformed mind. Begin to think in a whole new way. And that is a gift of grace, my friends. That too is a gift of the, of the Holy Spirit. Meta noia. To change your mind, to be transformed in the mind, to do the works, Jesus says, that you did at first. And yes, he says works. We're not saved by the works, but Jesus says do them. <laughs> do the works. Do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will remove your lampstand from its place. Wow. You know, when the light goes out, you might as well just... Jesus reminds the Ephesians that love is certainly love for Jesus himself, but it's also a practical love. Do the works you did at first. Do them. Love is not just talking love. Love is walking love. In the early church, love was about really concrete things, like hospitality and practical help to those in need, especially the poor and the sick and the hungry, Christians provided some of the first emergency medical care ever given in the Roman Empire, in ancient Rome, during times of war and plague. That's how Christians began to win over people to, to himself, was their sacrificial love. No other ethnic group or religious group had behaved like that before. They believed this love was, was just a dim reflection of God's love for them. It was the best advertisement possible of their faith. And we see that's true still today. Let the loveless church be put on notice, Jesus says. 
If I have prophetic powers, Paul says, and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to be able to remove or move a mountain, but I don't have love, Paul says. In Romans 13, the Mount Everest of the book of 1 Corinthians 13, of 1 Corinthians, and have not love, what does he say? I am nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing without that. Paul knew it. We know it. Sadly, the church at Ephesus, which was among the major Christian centers of the ancient world, it's vanished. If you go to Ephesus today, there's not a sign. There's no, there's no active Christian church in that part of the world, in, that, in, in Ephesus. Friends, let's be here tomorrow. Let's be here next year. Let's be here in 10 years. And I'm talking about beyond our own lifetimes. Let's be here in the great council, the great cloud of witnesses, in the great council of the church, the great cloud of witnesses of the church. Let's pray right now. For all eternity, let's pray for the continuing relevance and power and love of St. John's Presbyterian Church. Praying beyond our own lives to the future of a church that loves as Jesus called us to love until he comes again. Because we never abandon our first zestful love of Christ or his loving ways. So Jesus' message to the church in Ephesus ends with this word of promise that still holds true for Christians in every place and time. He says, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. It's an obvious reference to the life-giving tree of Genesis chapter 2, a tree which following the sin of Adam and Eve was guarded by this flaming sword. And at the end of Revelation, there's the tree again, the tree of life at the center of the new Jerusalem, the the heavenly city, the city of God. And there it is, and everybody's eating from that tree. I know no better representation of the tree of life than the one that's right outside. Not many churches can say that. Go look at it. Let it be a reminder of the tree of life in the center of the city of God bearing fruit for eternal life to all who have conquered this world by faith and persevering in love. Last week I asked you, what is your Patmos? This week I want to ask us a different question. How are you and I revealing love? Let me ask it again. How are you and I revealing love? This past week we saw yet another horrific example of cold-hearted violence. We saw a chain reaction of hate explode inside of an 18-year-old young man. We don't even know the context. We don't know what what all happened. But all the wrong ingredients came together in that moment to create hell on earth. And love was nowhere to be found in that moment. The love of God was absent. in that in that man but the love of god for that man and for those children was present and we could see it in the outcry in the sorrow in the tears in the rage that god has placed in our own hearts for a broken world metanoia things need to change That was a revelation of despair, but God wants to reveal love in you and me. Let us pray. I want to invite us right now to take a moment of silent prayer as we ponder this call. Ponder this call to overcome icy indifference and despair and hate with a love 
of Christ to stand in love with him. pray with me. Lord, at times we have drifted from the intimacy which we enjoyed with you at the beginning and the love you called us to have for each other. We don't want knowledge and faith that moves mountains without the healing power of your compassion. And so we ask you to cleanse us from our sin and to relight the lamp of our first and greatest love. We seek today the blessing of hearing and obeying your words and ways, and the courage to be your witnesses despite adversity. We ask you for your pardon and power where we have failed or shrunk back in fear. We begin this new season humbly on our knees, for you are the one who loves us and freed us from our sins by your blood. May it burn bright with holy affection. Renew our passion to love you deeply and to love this world sacrificially, for then we will be eating from the tree of life and walking with you in joyous forever fellowship. Amen.